All right. Well, folks, we're just giving it another second or two as people continue to log on. Um, so welcome. I'm Roxanne White with your facilitation team, which is myself and Sabrina and Yvonne. And in just a couple of minutes, we will turn it to the CPD team as, as well. Um, so Sarah, let me know when you'd like to go ahead and get started as we know people are also trying to figure out lots of tech issues today. Maybe give it one more minute. Okay. Councilwoman, it's always great to have our council members active and here. Um, we appreciate your support. Oh, well, thank you for the invite. Honored to be here as well. I had an opportunity to view the um, tutorial meeting that you had around the Denver zoning code. And I have to say the CPD staff did an excellent job, uh, Rob and Andrew and Sarah, and now I've started calling out people's names. So I'm super sorry if I missed somebody, but I was taking notes um, just alongside the rest of you all. So it was very helpful. Great job, everybody. Thank you. I do have time to do that too. <laughs> That's always great well, to hear. I think we're getting a few more on, but uh, I'll say a few things that might just be a reminder anyways. So that's probably okay if people are Are, are you going to start or do you want me to start, Sarah? Or sorry, you can go ahead. Yes. <laughs> okay, great. So uh, welcome everyone. Thanks for bearing with us. We have moved to a new platform with Zoom, which is seated all of our task force members as panelists. And that's going to hopefully allow us to have better conversations with each other. And so while the chat function is on, we would ask that to the extent you're able to do so, please continue to raise your hand and participate um, verbally first, and we will do our best to call on everyone. For a few of you logging in, it logged you on as Yvonne Miranda. And while I would love to be Yvonne, um, you may wanna go up to your three dots and change your name. Um, we don't know why that, is doing that today in the technology world. Um, it is one of the many glitches folks have, present, have felt today. For those of you who are on as observers, we are delighted to have you. Thank you for your interest. Thank you for attending. We will have an opportunity um, in the last um, 15 minutes or so of the meeting to have public comment. And we encourage you at that point to raise your hands, to ask questions to contribute your thinking um, at that point. And that allows the task force members to focus with each other, but it also ensures we will get a chance to hear from each of you and your interests and concerns. So thank you both to our task force members and to our observers today. As always, the meeting is recorded. Um, so for, for public to review later, for people if you have to leave early or miss a meeting, that sort of thing, or you need to go back and refresh it, we post that um, within a week or so after the meetings, we do a little bit of cleanup on the beginning so you don't have to listen to the music, that sort of thing, um, and get that just posted just as quickly as I can. So. Again, uh, thank you all for being here. And um, to the extent possible, please raise your hands. Um, if I miss you for some reason, flag it in chat for us. And on that note, I'll turn it to Sarah and the CPD team. Perfect. Thank you so much for that introduction. And thank you guys for being here. If you give me just one minute, I'm going to share my screen. Hopefully you can see that now. Yes. Perfect. All right, well, again, um, I'm gonna introduce myself. I'm Sarah Course. I'm the project manager for the Advancing Equity Rezoning Project. And we're here today for the second task force meeting, which is very exciting. So I'm gonna give a quick recap on sort of the completed progress that we've done for this project, upcoming progress, as well as just a quick overview of what we'll cover today. So looking at what we've completed so far, on January 12th, we had the first task force meeting and it included information about what this project is all about. We also had some great breakout groups where we discussed rezoning, uh, rezoning scenarios to start thinking about the rezoning process, as well as for you guys to give initial feedback on how the rezoning process could start to change. And then we had an optional task force orientation. So this was an educational session and it was to learn about what zoning is and 
to get an in-depth overview of the rezoning process. If you are able to attend that orientation, all those meetings, all the materials, including videos are posted to the project's webpage as well. So right after that, we actually had some focus group meetings. So these meetings captured people who submitted an online interest form voicing their interest in this project, as well as being on a focus group. So these groups talked about their experiences with the rezoning process or the impacts of it. And they also gave some initial feedback on issues or solutions. And there's notes from these focus group meetings posted on the webpage as well. And then moving into upcoming progress. So we're at the second task force meeting today, which will primarily be about the city's work related to equity, as well as an overview of task force member roles. And then looking ahead, the third task force meeting will be on Wednesday, March 23rd. At that meeting, we plan to discuss things along the lines of rezoning trends that we see in Denver, confirming the problem statement, as well as goals, and hopefully get to potentially discuss some quick wins or items that can definitely be addressed to this project as well. We're also planning on having our first community meeting in the next couple of months. We're still in the process of scheduling this meeting. So once it's scheduled, we'll let everyone know what it is and ways that you can help spread the word as well. And at that meeting, we would plan to go over the project scope, what it's about, how people can get engaged in this project, and for the community to also confirm the problem statements and goals for this project as well. So on top of that, we're planning on doing some more focus group meetings. We're again looking for focus group members. So if you know of anyone that would be interested in talking about their rezoning experience, how they have been impacted by rezonings, or how they've participated as part of the rezoning process, um, please connect us with them or point people to the online interest form that we have on our webpage as well. So looking to the meeting today, we'll start with introductions. We'll also discuss a background of the city's work related to equity, and we'll have some time after that for discussion questions. Then we'll review the task force member roles with also time after that for discussion questions. And then at the end, just what Rox um, mentioned, there will be some time for public comment as well. So that's just a quick summary of where we were, where we're hoping to go. And at this point, I'm gonna pass it off to do introductions from city staff. So I'll start with Liz, if she would like to introduce herself. Hi, everybody, good to see you again. I'm Liz Weigel and I'm the rezoning planning supervisor and um, I'm part of the project team. Thanks for coming today. And I'll turn it to Andrew. Well, hello, good afternoon, everyone. I'm Andrew Webb, I'm senior city planner for community planning and development, and I'm currently the team lead for our MAP amendments group and part of this project team, and I'll pass on to Rob. Hello, I'm Rob Haig. I'm also a planner with CPD and a member of the project team, and uh, give it over to Mike. Hey, everybody. Mike Ramsey here, um, the community engagement specialist for all of CPD, um, especially working on this project. I think we got the whole CPD staff. Thank you so much. And if you all remember at our first meeting, we introduced ourselves by getting to know a little bit more about what love we each have for Denver. As some of you shared the high schools you graduated from, where you like to recreate with your dogs and various things. At the orientation meeting, which was not required, um, folks introduced themselves similar to how we're going to introduce ourselves today, but we wanna to continue to get to know people and know who's here. So on that note, Yvonne, I'm going to turn it to you. And just a reminder, if you're logging in, just double check your name that allowed you to log in as the person you really are. And Yvonne, walk us through um, introductions, please. Welcome back, Task Force members. I am the in real life Yvonne Miranda. So I apologize to anybody who is seeing my name reflected on their Zoom. Um, I would like for us to do a quick round of introductions just a few seconds focusing on your name, your organization, and what brought you onto the task force. I will go ahead and call people after a couple seconds, starting in reverse alphabetical order. And we'll start with Steve Harley. I didn't realize I was reverse end of the alphabet. Hi folks, I'm Steve Harley. Um, I'm a member of the Baker Historic Neighborhood Association, BHNA but I'm not an official delegate to this process from them. I'm representing myself, but I am communicating back to BHNA and I may bring BHNA's thoughts to you. Um, my interest in, in this 
Dems, uh, most recently, at least in Denver, to uh, participation in, in Making Connections Denver and it's uh, uh, some of the equity uh, activities it was doing, uh, including working on brownfields issues and mapping uh, areas in Denver that were involved in, in brownfields uh, redevelopment and contamination issues, and then working on the BHNA zoning committee, which I've chaired for a while, and learning a lot about uh, the zoning process and, and actually working through several different types of rezonings and um, some older processes such as PUDs and GPDs. Uh, I'm sorry, yeah. Um, uh, and so I've, I've gotten a lot of familiarity with, with zoning and I've also got a strong interest in um, how that impacts communities and I've seen Baker change a lot. And so that's given me some insight in what, uh, what it, it would mean to uh, refocus the rezoning, uh, to, to reshape the rezoning process. Thank you. Um, can we have Councilwoman Stacy Gilmore followed by Shara Smith? Uh, well, good afternoon. Thank you so much for being here. Uh, Stacy Gilmore, I'm the City Council representative for District 11. So it's the majority of the Montbello, High Point, Parkfield, and Green Valley Ranch uh, Council District, including Denver International Airport and also president of Denver City Council. And what brought me to the task force is we know that historically, especially communities of color have not perhaps gotten as robust or as many bells and whistles as other developments have throughout the city and county of Denver. And uh, that is very troublesome. And I wanna make sure that as we look forward to the future that we can rectify some of those issues and hear from community about other issues and get to addressing them so that we can begin to work on equity uh, and address those soon in uh, our communities of color, for sure. Thank you. Thank you. Um, can we get Robin Wood Mason, followed by Monica Martinez? Hi, everyone. I'm Robin Wood Mason, he, him pronouns. I'm the Director of Development and Communications for the Dolores Project, and I'm excited to be part of the task force because I'm really trying to approach this looking at how housing insecurity and homelessness is impacted, or the resolution of housing insecurity and homelessness, I should say, is impacted by rezoning and how we can help make sure that people living in our communities um, are kept in our communities as we go through this process. Thank you. It looks like we've lost Monica, so I'm gonna go over to Myra Gonzalez, followed by Maggie. Hi, everybody, Myra Gonzalez. I live out here in the far north East and District 11, and I work with a local nonprofit called the Montbello Organizing Committee. Thank you. Maggie? Hi, all. Good afternoon. Maggie Lee here. She, her pronouns. I work with Mile High Connects. We are a regional collaborative working on intersecting issues surrounding affordable housing, climate, and transportation. Um, and uh, we were pivotal in really helping to create um, Blueprint Denver. And there is a lot in Blueprint Denver that refers to rezonings. And I don't know much about them. So I wanted to not only learn, but also um, come in and see where I can influence and help to, uh, represent community. Thank you. Um, can we get Lou Raiders followed by Londell Jackson and Lindsay Miller? Hi, this is Lou Raiders. I am um, a retired attorney who did a lot of real estate and zoning work. Um, I also have been very interested in a lot of anti-racism research and um, equity. So right now in my retired state, I'm actually joining you from Maui. How lucky am I? Um, but I am uh, the current chair of the Cherry Creek Steering Committee and the president of Cherry Creek North. And even before that have served on many zoning committees and participated in some of the um, community activities around the Cherry Creek area plan and, and uh, First Avenue redevelopment. So I'm uh, pleased to be a part of this process. Great, Andal. Yes, hello, good afternoon. My name is Londell Jackson, and I am a um, 
sixth generation Colorado Territory native and a fourth generation Denverite. And um, I live in the Sunnyside neighborhood, which is gentrifying. And I um, want to know, um, want to be a part of how the city in which I grew up is changing um, and how it is seemingly um, in many ways deliberately pushing out people um, that have lived in neighborhoods and, and making it um, unaffordable, inaffordable, or just unobtainable for individuals to live in the neighborhoods in which they grew up um, and have um, for generations. Um, and so um, I feel that I owe it to um, those of us who um, have been here for quite a while. And as a worker in the national, statewide, and local nonprofit sectors and workforce development areas, um, that is part of my um, outreach for the past 30 years. Um, and so here I am. Thank you very much. Thank you, Amdel. Let's get Lindsay Miller, Joel Noble, and Geraldine Castilla. Hello, uh, my name is Lindsay Miller. I'm with Beyond Growth Strategies, my equitable development consulting firm. Um, a lot of my work over the past few years has been in the Sun Valley neighborhood, which is undergoing a major redevelopment, um, working on the community benefits agreement with the community group, and now working with Sun Valley Kitchen, which is a really essential community-based organization in this neighborhood as it um, as it undergoes redevelopment and experiences a lot of displacement. Um, so interest in equitable development brought me to this task force and seeing how we could advance various equity measures in redevelopment. Thanks, Joel. Hi, I'm Joel Noble. I'm in the Curtis Park neighborhood. I've been involved in my neighborhood organization for a lot of years. Uh, Today, I serve on the Denver Planning Board, and I'm very interested in um, translating some of the equity goals in Blueprint Denver into how we do rezoning, um, specifically, not so much about the criteria. I'm not sure the criteria uh, is the issue, more of our, more rather our practices around translating our plans and neighborhood plans into zoning uh, that, that result in very inequitable outcomes where uh, more change than our plans call for is directed in uh, areas of lower income uh, that typically don't show up for public hearings and less change uh, goes in areas where people have uh, more privilege and show up and participate. And there's, there's something very funky in that dynamic. There are other topics we'll talk to uh, as well. Thank you. Geraldine Flor Alvidres and Aaron Clark. I'm Geraldine Castillo. I'm a business owner and we have Plaza de Santa Fe Liquors in the shop at across the street from King Supers at 1355 Santa Fe Drive. And I'm interested in learning more about the rezoning process, starting with our current property and trying to understand how it evolved and where it's moving to. Thank you. Flor? Hello, Flor here. Uh, I am a real estate agent and from Denver. And a lot of my family and friends have small businesses and they have been, you know, I would say victims of rezoning that made them feel like they had to sell their properties and they could long, no longer do business there. So I definitely am very passionate about helping, helping my people out. So that's why I'm here. Thank you. Erin Clark. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. <clears throat> Excuse me. Um, so I'm Erin Clark. I am uh, I wear a few different hats. Um, I, by education and profession, am an urban planner and a real estate attorney. I am a Denver native. Um, I work in affordable housing with Urban Land Conservancy, and I also uh, serve on the Denver Planning Board. I have served, I have been a professional urban planner in the past. So I've been on the staff side presenting about rezonings in other jurisdictions. And now here in the city of Denver, I'm uh, receiving that information and helping to make recommendations on rezoning applications to the city council. Um, but I've also drafted uh, 
zoning codes in the past and things like that. So I've really tried to look at this from per the perspective of um, why we do the rezoning in the first place and how we set up the processes and what it's like to be <laughs> on the other end trying to get properties rezoned and, and as many of you have noted here, kind of what that process looks like for, um, for our friends and neighbors. Um, and so I'm here because I think it's critically important that uh, we don't just focus on equitable outcomes, but the inputs are very important and, and the rezoning process um, and the procedures and who's involved in that and, and the substance of that involvement um, is really critical. Uh, if we have more equitable inputs on the front end, uh, hopefully that leads us to more equitable outcomes. So um, that's, that's why I'm here. Thank you, Erin. Can we hear from Elaine Minji Limmer, followed by Claudia Folska and Caitlin Quander? Um, hi, everybody. I'm Elaine. I'm also a planner by profession, um, but I'm more what drew me to the task force is more of the fact that I am a new resident of Denver. Um, my husband and I relocated here from Boston last summer and um, just thinking through what it means to just be really intentional about being responsible new residents of a city and connecting to um, what's going on in the community. And of course, as a planning nerd, part of that for me is understanding equity and zoning. So that was my main draw for joining the task force. Thank you. Claudia Polska. Do we have Claudia with us? No, but the phone is uh, Shara, if we want to go to her. All right, Shara. Can you hear me? We can hear you. Wonderful. Good afternoon, everyone. Shara Smith, she, her pronouns. I'm the executive director of the Interfaith Alliance of Colorado. I am here because we have a statewide network of over 400 congregations um, and another 300 that we intend to bring into our network and our congregations um, in being on the forefront of what's happening in communities are typically interested in affordable housing solutions, zoning and equity. So I am here to um, better understand the process so that I can help inform our faith families about this process, what's possible and how. So that's why I'm here. Thank you, Shara. I'm gonna go back to Caitlin Quander, followed by Brendan Green and Anna Dewitt. Hi everyone, Caitlin Quander. I am a land use attorney in town um, and so often I'm helping guide clients through the rezoning process because it isn't as simple as, um, as we all wish it was. And so often I'm hired by small businesses or, or large developers to help guide them in that process. Um, and then uh, Joel actually touched on it. I served on the Blueprint Denver Task Force um, as the comprehensive plan was looked at by the city and, and redone. And we set out a lot of goals around equity. And I think this is really the next stage on implementing some of those goals to really put some meat on the bones for what we, we outlined as um, our priorities for the city. So look forward to that conversation. Thank you. Brendan Green. Hi, I'm Brendan Green with the East Colfax Community Collective and a board member of the East Colfax Neighborhood Association. And excited to be with everybody working on this important project. Um, my my passion is really trying to center and focus um, the conversation around communities that are at risk of displacement, and hoping that we can do everything we can to help protect those communities as a part of this process. Thank you. Thank you, Anna Dewitt, and finally Councilwoman and Amanda Sandoval. Hi everyone, um, Anna Dewitt. I am a board member of UMB Denver. Um, I don't know if I'm here necessarily representing them, but I'm here personally because um, displacement and affordable housing is really important to me. And a huge part of that I find is putting more equity in our rezoning process. Right now we're looking at a 12 month turnover for new projects to even hit ground um, when we're in a desperate housing crisis. Um, another idea UMB supports is ending single family zoning so that we can bring more housing to everyone. 
Um, and I am also personally here, or how I even got involved in this whole thing, was being a, a small time little person applicant for rezoning. So I kind of like have lived that experience of what it's like to go through a rezoning process. Thank you. Councilwoman Amanda Sandoval. Good afternoon, everyone. Amanda Sandoval, I represent the north side of Denver. So if you think of Highland, Sunnyside, um, West Colfax, um, born and raised in that neighborhood. My family started La Casita in that neighborhood in 1972 and has been steadfast there. Um, I started as a council aide 10 years ago and really dove into the zoning side of things. So we're city council members and land use commissioners. And when I got elected in 2019 and we updated Blueprint Denver, I started asking when was the last time we looked at how we did our rezoning process and had we updated the rezoning process to match this new um, document that was guiding how Denver was going to grow out. And the answer was that we hadn't updated some of these processes since the 50s. And so I'm all about making sure that we have modernized processes to make sure that we are representing the underrepresented. Um, I think I ran and won to not always represent the people who have a voice, but probably the 30% of people who don't come to things, who don't have a voice, who don't show up. And so I want to make sure that as we move forward with rezonings, which I know that this task force says that it's only 10% of the city that gets rezoned. But last night, Councilwoman Gilmer and I were at city council till 1030 at night. And I serve as a vice chair of the land use commission or the land use um, re, uh, committee on Tuesdays. And so even though it's only 10% of the city, I would say it takes up at least 80% of my time. And so in my world, that me, that is a really big process. And so I wanna make sure that we're getting better outcomes for our future generations. Um, to Lundell, your point, my kids will be our fifth generation Denverites. And so I'm doing this for them. And I'm doing this for all of those people like my kids who can't afford to live on the north side. I bought at 21. People don't buy at 21 anymore. And so I'm doing this for them and all of those who will stand on my shoulders because I stand on those shoulders who came before me. Thank you. Thank you for sharing. Uh, we have two more members who have just joined us. We'll go with Alfonso Espinoso, followed by Brittany Catalinas. Hello, everyone. My name is Alfonso Espino. I'm here, first and foremost, representing uh, my communities in which I grew up in, Global Illyrian Swansea. Um, and I also have the honor and the privilege of working for the GS Coalition as a community organizer. Uh, excuse the cat in the background if you hear him. Um, but I, I am here uh, specifically in terms of the task force um, to really represent and bring points, um, a perspective um, that really centers the community and what I mean by the community, especially those neighborhoods, uh, the people that I know, uh, people that we all must know that come from vulnerable communities, so-called vulnerable communities. Um, really, they're just overexploited communities in the city of Denver um, and really, uh, bringing about uh, a change that depoliticizes uh, land use and zoning in Denver and really focuses and highlights the inequities. Um, and I think a big part of that will be through the criteria. Thank you, Brittany. Thank you, I'm Brittany Catalinas. Um, I'm assuming this is what draws us to this worker task force. Correct, your name, your organization and what brought you to the task force. <laughs> Thank you for all that. So I'm Brittany Catalinas. Uh, I'm the owner and founder of Be Connected. We connect uh, renters and landlords together for housing security and stability. And then I like to just say, we are landlord social workers. So our whole goal is to make sure that once we get people actually housed, more importantly, we give them and the landlords the tools to actually keep that housing. We spend a lot of time, I'm a social worker in my day life and an urban planner. And just as a social worker, we spend a lot of time in getting people housed, but then there's a lot of times where people go back into homelessness for various reasons. And I don't think locally we have enough conversations about the housing instabilities that we do have among uh, vulnerable renters 
and what that looks like and trying to actually stop that. So we are really focused on creating more tools than just eviction in our communities and rather giving tools of prevention and challenging the current way that we house people, but really creating prevention within real estate portfolios. So what brings us um, me into this meeting is um, I'm an urban, was an urban planner once, once at one point. So I, I know, I know and understand the value of rezoning. And then uh, also it goes into that um, as well. So it just in general, we want to be here. I work with a lot of landlords and tenants. I do a lot of relocations of people who are getting displaced. So just uh, being able to represent those voices and those different uh, clients and experiences. That's uh, why I'm here. And then I just also have lived experience myself of being displaced uh, as a when I was a younger person and then my early adulthood. So I understand what that looks like. And I am from a vulnerable community from Dayton, Ohio. So you start talking about a lot of the inequities just within a community that doesn't have resources, that doesn't have supports like we have here in Colorado. Uh, so it's, it's really a great privilege too to be in Colorado and in Denver where we fund things such as this and social services and housing. Can we do better? Yes, but we are waves ahead of a lot of other communities in this work. So thank you, thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing and reintroducing yourselves. We know it's been a long time since we were all together. So uh, with that, I will pass it over to Rox to talk Great. about Well, thank you all. And Brittany, thank you for reminding us about that. It's not enough, but we have a lot. Um, and how do we start to really think about this is by framing and thinking about how is the city of Denver thinking about equity and how will that influence our working and our thinking together? as we work on more equitable rezoning. And so we have a number of presentations that are going to go pretty fast for you all today. And because they are going to build on each other, we ask that you hold your questions. Um, and in about 25 minutes, we will have plenty of time for discussion and questions. Um, but because the speakers are building on each other um, and they're thinking, um, we're, we are asking for people to hold your questions if you are um, able to do so. It's great to have cameras on and just we understand that cats may punctuate some of the things that we're thinking or you may have to work with little ones. But it really is nice when we can see each other and um, and it also really helps your speakers a lot. So to the extent that you are able and willing to turn on your cameras, I know your speakers will um, really appreciate that. So on that note, Sarah, let's go to you. Alex, thank you. That was a great uh, quick overview of where we're headed next, but I'll just add on that at the first task force meeting, we mentioned how our citywide plans inform our projects. And one of the main ideas or kind of vision elements of our plan is advancing equity and looking at these three different equity concepts that I discussed a little bit and how that informs this project. So I mentioned that a little bit at this meeting and we thought it'd be really good to take some time at this meeting to take a step back and you know, take it farther out outside of this project and look at what the city is doing from uh, various departments and get a better understanding of kind of our work and how it relates to advancing our own equity goals. So to start off, we're going to have Jason Harrison talk a little bit, and I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves when they come on, but I'll let Jason introduce himself before I start uh, sharing the screen, if that's okay. Appreciate you, Sarah, and thank you. Good evening to everybody. My name is Jason Harrison. I use he, him pronouns. I am with the Mayor's Office of Social Equity and Innovation. Um, I'm born and raised in Aurora, Colorado, so Denver is where I call home for my work, but Aurora is where I call home for my house. So really excited to talk to you all at a high level at how we as a city are moving forward. And so, Sarah, if you want to go ahead and start the presentation, we can do that. Appreciate that. So at the Mayor's Office of Social Equity and Innovation, we're actually the youngest and the newest office here in the city and county of Denver. Um, and we really work at kind of the nexus of all of the agencies and their efforts to move equity forward as a city. And so Sarah, if you can go to the next slide. So our vision as a city is to embed equity into all of, our, all of the facets of our operations from our, our policies, our practices, our budget decisions, every single thing that we do here at the city, we wanna try to embed equity. And so for us, as an office specifically, what we're trying to do is really utilize those innovative and best and often new practices to lead Denver in this transformative change. Next slide. Um, and so what even is equity and, and how do we define something that 
has never really existed historically. And I really want to lean into a comment that Erin made when Erin was introducing herself, but equity is both a product and a process. And so when we're thinking about equity as a product, we're really thinking about this in historic terms, right? For, for, for almost the first time in our nation's history, we're seeing local municipal governments really taking on this task of thinking through what does equity look like in a tangible way? What is that product? And really to us, the product of equity is when we know that race and our other social identities can no longer be used to predict life outcomes. Unfortunately, we know that race is often the number one predictor of life outcomes across any sort of measurement that we're working with. And so we at our office are very explicit about leading with race in our work, but that does not come at the expense of, of acknowledging the intersections of all of our identities. And so that is uh, very much critical and core to our tenant for how we move this work forward. Additionally, equity is both a process. And so when we're thinking about a process of equity, what we're thinking about is how are we centering those who have been most marginalized, who have been most underrepresented in these processes that we work with here at the city and county of Denver. And that's really where this task force comes to light, right? It is, it is part of the process to develop a product that allows us to, to get to more equitable outcomes. Next slide, Sarah. Now, in thinking about kind of the timeline of my office in particular, again, this is very new work for the city and county of Denver from, a, from an institutional perspective. Uh, so, so really, our office was kind of codified in 2019. Um, it, it birthed out of what was the Race and Social Justice Initiative, which was a part of a broader effort that was happening um, with certain municipalities across the country. In early 2020, the mayor signed Executive Order 146, which really codified our, our purpose and our, and our um, institutional kind of processes for doing this work. And, and what that allowed us to do was really help um, identify and, and, and create within our operations for all of our city agencies a way to move equity forward, which I'll keep talking about. Next slide. Now, Part of that framework that we utilize to do this comes from uh, a national consortment of, of entities, and, and that is the GAIR, which is the Government Alliance on Racial Equity. And what they use as their framework for advancing this is through what they call these three pillars of normalize, organize, and operationalize. And so a lot of our work at the Mayor's Office of Social Equity and Innovation is to really help normalize these conversations, normalize these practices across all city agencies, and then allow us to organize accordingly so that we can ultimately operate operationalize them, which let's get into the operation component of it. Um, before you can, uh, you know, operationalize something, you have to have a goal and a vision for what that is. And so here at the city and county of Denver, we really focus on four avenues for trying to move this work forward, making sure that Denver is an inclusive employer, making sure Denver is an inclusive city, making sure Denver is an inclusive government, and that Denver will use and base all of that work on nationally recognized research and data. So those four goals are really where we are striving to move this work forward. Next slide. And in order to do that, we needed commitment from and, and buy-in from all of our agencies. And so every single um, agency that is under the purview of the mayor, um, so in which the mayor appoints their executive appointee, um, they signed on an equity commitment. This equity commitment, again, further codified within our city operations, the commitment of all of our agencies like community planning and development, that equity will be a core value that we will actualize in our work. Next slide. And so then what does that look like? How does that manifest? How do we operationalize something that's never been done before? And so we're really trying to take a couple different approaches. So first and foremost, we're training all city staff currently in the Race and Social Justice Academy. And what that allows us to do is set a baseline or a shared foundation for all of our employees to be able to have these conversations, to have a framework for which to engage this work in. Additionally, all of our agencies have created citywide equity, diversity, and inclusion teams, which are representative of the various divisions that make up their department or agency. And then those EDI teams are responsible for crafting equity action plans, which are specific strategies for how do we operationalize and move equity forward. Currently here at the city, we have over 120 strategies um, that are actively being worked on to embed equity into their operations. And we use a dashboard to track all of that and hold ourselves accountable to that work. So that's kind of just a high level overview of our office, how our office is kind of serving as that nexus to move us forward in this equity work. We're going to kick it over to Elvis and we're going to learn a little bit more about the work that's happening in the Department of Economic Development and our specific Nest neighborhoods. 
Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Elvis Ruby. I'm the Deputy Director of Neighborhood Equity and Stabilization, also known as NES. And I'll kind of build off, build off of what Jason was saying and really the process of moving equity forward, specifically in, in Denver projects or Denver investments. Next slide, please. So really here at NES, we, our, our vision, I won't read it for you verbatim, but basically what we do is we support neighborhoods that are experiencing gentrification or, or that are at risk of displacement, right? And how we do that, we empower under-resourced um, communities, organizations, or, or residents and businesses that have historically been marginalized, right, in their area. And, and we really serve as that convener or connector. Uh, for the community, for nonprofits, we try to we work to elevate their voice and really helping them um, be heard when when the city comes and invests and really have a, an input on how their neighborhood or community is shaped. And we do that by focusing on these on these neighborhoods that you see highlighted on your screen in light blue. There are ten neighborhoods that are basically um, designated off of key indicators that track or identify displacement. You can think of cost, cost burden households, which means they spend 30% or more of their income on rents, uh, education attainment, medium household income, access to transit, et cetera. There's, there's different indicators that are used to identify these neighborhoods, but out of those, out of these neighborhoods rose to the top based on those indicators. So we really focus our efforts on these targeted neighborhoods. And I know the screen is hard to read, so I'm just gonna read them out there for you. It's East Colfax, Elaria Swansea, Globeville, Montbello, Northeast Park Hill, Sun Valley, Valverde, Villa Park, West Colfax, and Westwood. The strategy behind our work, right, is really uh, educating residents, promoting opportunity, and really, we are a funder. We fund organizations, initiatives, and efforts. Uh, the idea behind the strategic approach is that we can use this in other, in other areas of, of the city that are experience, experiencing large-scale development. Next slide, please. So uh, just getting to how we do this, right? We, we really, our, our, our main goal and what we're working for is to reduce involuntary displacement, uh, improve access to opportunity, cultivate responsible and equitable growth that preserves the character and vitality of Denver's neighborhoods. So that's, you know, one of the things that when we hear about investment and thinking about equity and rezoning and, and changes in neighborhoods is you lose the character, you lose the people who live there. So really, we, we try, NEST itself tries to build relationships, fund certain programming that builds wealth building, and then really um, work to build a capacity of, of leadership and community to help uh, elevate their voice. Again, we don't want to speak on their behalf, but we want to elevate those voices to be heard and have a say of what happens in their community. Next slide. So really how we do this, uh, just kind of building off the previous slide, um, there's multiple facets to our work. We build partnerships with community stakeholders. Uh, we invest in direct services, and then we support um, individuals and community organizations. And we do that either by either grants. We administer the community development block grant. We also offer mini grant, uh, mini grants that um, are used to strengthen neighborhoods that can serve for a variety of purposes. We build capacity of small businesses, either through education or programming. We fund what, what are called business support offices, which generally are neighborhood serving business organizations that provide marketing support, uh, navigation support, technical assistance for businesses or residents or what have you. And then we also have a component for youth. Um, we're, we, we're thinking outside of the box for future. When you think of apprenticeship program, you think of construction, uh, construction or, oriented um, careers and the, the career wise program under NEST really is, is providing access to, to kids to take a non-traditional apprenticeship and professional career development. So we, we pair these uh, kids from our NEST neighborhoods um, with professional careers, whether it's an art, art engineer, um, accountant, a planner, uh, community development representative, stuff like that, to just expose them to different career and options uh, outside of your traditional apprenticeship program. So thinking again in, in culturally responsive and really more so providing opportunity to other things that folks in, our, in these historically marginalized neighborhoods don't have access to. Next slide. So these are uh, kind of building again off of those previous slides and just really identifying some of the work that we do with our funding. Uh, we administer the CDBG um, uh, CDBG funding, which is a community development block grant. We offer um, 
we offer what, what is also known as public facilities improvements. We can help businesses that are at risk or nonprofits that are at risk acquire their building. That'll help them stay in their community and hopefully grow. Or if they're looking to grow, we can fund certain things to that matter, right? There's requirements, but generally we can help. Uh, we partner with organizations locally that, that serve the community. Uh, we connect that, that part of being a connector and convener. We really try to elevate the voices of community. We don't try to speak on your behalf. We bring you to the table. We want you to connect to the people who make the decisions. We want you to advocate for for your community. Um, we also work. We also work again uh, with CareerWise. And, and during COVID, we offered a lot of um, emergency response to try to keep to try to stabilize businesses and org uh, nonprofits in their community, right? So we offered a lot of relief funding and, and a lot of other programs that were really tailored to keeping people in place during COVID. And now in 2022, we're kind of looking at more so neighborhood corridor activation and how we can think of business development in a sense of co-op where we can build off of the previous work that we've done to provide different options for our, our neighborhoods. And then next slide, please. So with all of that, this kind of slide kind of uh, summarizes some of the work and I apologize that I'm talking so fast and high level, but where this all comes into place is specific to rezoning. In those last two bullet points where we advocate for community responses change and changes within community city uh, departments and where we kind of convene meetings or participate in meetings that are uh, related to involuntary displacement, Nest spe specifically sits on what is called uh, a housing coordination committee where we see rezonings that come in through the city um, specific to nest neighborhoods if, if we see that there's a risk for displacement or it hits certain indicators we we flag that that project and really um, encourage and highly recommend that developer the city to think outside of your general community engagement of, of just uh, notifying an RNO or posting a sign on the property we, we push them further we connect them to the to those community organizations talk to so and so this person talk to this community instead of just their traditional engagement of reaching an RNO and we're also part of what is called the multi-department alignment Per, um, committee or, or depart executive committee. We, we for projects that are larger, uh, five, and I want to say, and please correct me if I'm wrong for some of my uh, CPD folks, um, uh, LDR related projects that are five acres or more, uh, there's a group of city agencies that we we talk, we, we come together, we convene and, and see how we can really push forward equity and, and really community serving spaces and in general in a holistic approach, how the a development could better serve a community that's going to be a part of right so nest really focuses on on trying to. Um, elevate community voice and connect people and really when the developers come into the city or into an area that not, that they don't just extract that they realize they're being a part of a community and that community needs to be involved so one way or the other or be heard when they're coming to the community right so thank you that's all i really have uh for here and i'll kick it off to mike thank you appreciate it, elvis all right hey everybody my name is mike ramsey um also born in denver uh but opposite of jason now i live in aurora so um, I still claim uh, Denver these days, <laughs> um, but anyway, uh, it's all good because we're all doing this together. Um, now that uh, Jason gave us kind of like a foundation of the equity work as a city as a whole, um, and Elvis kind of helped us uh, realize uh, how this work is transforming in different organizations, uh, particularly to him, Nest, um, I would like to take a moment to talk about community planning and development um, and our equity work. Um, Go ahead and change sides up. Thank you, Sarah. Um, so just a quick overview, because uh, I do like to uh, base this in the framework of equity um, and uh, kind of like the, the philosophy and, and the words that are used to give us the vision uh, that we're working with. Ours is coming up. So CPDs is coming from two main plans, uh, the Comprehensive Plan 2040, uh, which is a, a a 20 year vision for the city of Denver uh, and the people that live and work inside of this city and make it run. Um, the other is Blueprint Denver, which uh, some of you know well um, and have worked on, um, which is more related to the vision of Denver's land use and transportation. Uh, so with those two together um, and with OSEI's help, uh, we create that vision um, of equitable work. And a big thing with vision is, is we need, also need to make it uh, an action uh, like Jason said, equity is a, is a product and a process. Um, and so we try to do those simultaneously. <clears throat> and one of those 
Uh, go ahead and Sarah, switch sides or switch slides. Thank you. One of those is my role. Uh, my role is brand new. Uh, it's only been around for one year, uh, but CPD create was able to create a position to specifically focus on inclusion. Um, and, and what my role is a community engagement specialist is I try to create and help collaborate on designing and, and implementing um, different ways to engage folks that historically have not been a part of this process. Uh, that's gonna be one of the main pieces of equitable work is hearing voice, inviting people into the process as much as we can more and more and more. We know it's not gonna change overnight, uh, but through collaboration uh, with a lot of partners here today, uh, citywide and, and even neighborhood specific, uh, we can make changes, you know, step by step, day by day. Uh, and that's a lot of that action work. So, you know, one of the main ways to do it is to, um, that CPD is doing it is, is hiring people, hiring more people to focus on it uh, and to focus on inclusion. Um, and we know that in, in uh, inviting indifference requires a difference, right? So that means in techniques, in styles, um, in ways that we collect voice and uplift voice and talk about that voice um, and put weight to that voice. Um, and that's a, a big part of what I do. And, you know, I've met some of you uh, through phone and a lot of it is about that invitation. Um, and how we do that is, is three, three big things. Is again, it's reaching out. Uh, so it's about how we out, do outreach. Uh, we have done it in different ways, like in the near Northwest, uh, during the summer, we were actually teamed up with uh, Parks and Rec and a um, nonprofit that was up there and uh, did, a, did a basketball tournament. Uh, so it wasn't focused around the civic engagement, right? That was just, a, that was just a, a product of it. But a lot of it was around community building, trying to build that trust up again, um, trying to invite folks in a different way, because we know historically what has been done uh, isn't getting to everyone. Um, and again, like what, what Jason said earlier, uh, the city of Denver as an institution hasn't been doing this for that long. It's relatively new. Um, so we're creating different ways to go about this. Um, another one is uh, navigators. We're using community nav navigators, uh, which are really just a different way to say, we're trying to rely on folks who experience their neighborhood changing uh, and experience the things that are happening uh, in their everyday life and use that voice uh, instead of us um, rewriting someone else's story. We're really trying to connect with people who are living and breathing uh, and experiencing what is happening to the city and to their neighborhoods and to their houses um, and translating that and really trying to create a, a, you know, a report or a video or something like that out of that. So that's a big tool that we're using. So relying more on collaborations and, and teamwork and people who, you know, are living it instead of just relying on, on me, for example, just going out there. Uh, so a lot more collaboration. The other one is, is youth engagement. We're doing a lot more youth engagement. Uh, we're trying to get the voice of, of the future generations of this city to help us plan, to help us think, to help us create, uh, and to help us congregate. And this is where, you know, again, youth have not been in, invited into this to the process as much as we would like. And so we're really focusing on that as a key piece uh, these days um, and hopefully trying to reach out to the, the family and adult that are connected to those youth through that. Um, of course, doing other things, uh, but that's just one area of the intersection of equitable work that we're really trying to focus on. Um, and another example uh, would be something like the Latino Chicano Historic Context Project, uh, which is really kind of laying a foundation of um, what has been the history of uh, Latino and Chicano folks in the city and how can we put that to paper and make sure that um, changes uh, that affect uh, different populations across the city are, are in touch with this. So we know um, that, that this is the voice that has been here for a long time um, and who, again, who hasn't been a part of the process and invited in as much and now we're really trying to say, hey, okay, let's take specific moments and, and spread that word out and uplift that voice as much as we can in every plan that we do um, and every project that we do and things like that. So those are just some examples, um, but it's also very important to keep track of those and, and, and measure those things. And, and Sarah will take it from here. Perfect, thank you so much, Mike. So I'll dive in a little bit more and talk about the 
equity concepts that we keep mentioning. So we've heard a variety of information around the concepts of improving access to opportunity, reducing vulnerability to displacement, and expanding housing and jobs diversity. So how do we actually use them? So we use them to help us tailor projects and plans to reflect unique strategies and approaches needed for different populations. And they also help guide us in our implementation actions, such as this project. So it's difficult to know how we're making progress in terms of achieving our equity goals unless you start measuring, measuring it, right? So we need to make sure we're measuring where we're at to know if we're actually improving access to opportunity or expanding housing and job diversity. So luckily we do have a methodology for that and we have a way to measure that. So now I'll jump to the maps that you saw at the first task force meeting and we'll talk a little bit about what those colors on the map mean and kind of what are the data points for these maps. So the first one is we measure access to opportunity. And the data points we look at here are social determinants of health, the built environment, access to healthcare, morbidity, and mortality. So looking at the combination of these points, uh, we get this general determination of levels of access to opportunity in the city. So the darker purple would mean less access and the lighter purple would mean more access. And that's kind of the same as it goes into the other maps as well. When we look at vulnerability to displacement, we look at the percent of residents with less than a bachelor's degree um, that is higher than the city's average, as well as the percent of renter occupied units that's higher than the city's average. And the median household income is lower than the city's median, um, median household income. So looking at these combined, that's where we can start seeing areas that might be vulnerable, vulnerable to displacement as well. The next one is looking at housing diversity. First data point is housing diversity itself. In addition to that, looking at home size, the tenure diversity, the cost of housing, as well as the number of affordable housing units. And that's how we gauge what housing diversity is across the city. The next one is looking at jobs diversity. So that is the density of jobs, as well as the different types of jobs. And there's different, um, data points around that in terms of types of jobs, but we'll look at that to generally get a sense of diversity of jobs across the city as well. So looking forward into this project. So Blueprint Denver, again, has specific guidance for this project for addressing equity. And some of the specific language states that the city should consider adjustments to the applicant-driven rezoning process to better address important topics revealed by the equity concepts. In addition to that, the plan also states that we should create tools to increase access to the rezoning process, especially for underrepresented communities. So that's some very specific direction from Blueprint Denver that's looking for this project to better advance equity and those goals as well. So this project will also look to implement those recommendations and others as well. Um, but I wanna let you know of some other things that are going on that exist today that we might be considering in the project in the future. So we are implementing an equity analysis on larger development projects. I think Elvis mentioned LDR, so that's large development review. There's a process for reviewing our larger developments and equity analyses have become a part of that review. So we'll do this analysis and that will hopefully help guide, uh, guide us to have more successful outcomes and mitigate ne negative impacts. The next thing is that we require equity analyses during the rezoning pre-app stage for rezonings in nest neighborhoods. So Elvis touched on that a little bit. And then just to go over what an equity analysis is to start with, um, our staff uses the maps that I just talked about, as well as the measurements. And we use that to determine a score of a certain property. And then from there, we'll identify potential solutions if something scores low, like if it's scoring low, um, and has not much housing diversity, then maybe we would look to encourage the developer or the applicant to incorporate more housing diversity within their proposal. So lastly, uh, this project, Advancing Equity and Rezoning, will look to further advance the goals around equity. And we'll also take into consideration the equity analysis that I just mentioned, as um, this is work that we're already doing, and we'll consider that as we move forward with this project as well. So that was a summary of kind of what the city is doing from broad perspective and tying it back down to the project itself. At this point, I think I'm gonna pass it back to Rox. 
Great. Well, thank you. And a few of you have had questions in chat about what's required and what versus what's recommended in the noticing um, process. And Elvis, do you mind just um, answering a little bit in terms of what you referenced in terms of your recommendations or are they requirements? Sure, and I definitely don't want to overstep my boundaries a little bit on CPD, but in general, when, when an applicant applies for a rezoning, they're encouraged to discuss any potential plans that are relevant, right, to with relevant RNOs, city council, um, at-large city council members or interested parties, right? So we don't tell them how to do it. it the guidance is very broad. It's, it can be an email. It can be a community meeting. It's really up to the developer. So when we meet Ness, when we're invited to those meetings, or when we know a developer, a development's going to be in one of those neighborhoods, one of our Ness neighborhoods, I, I contact them directly. My team will contact them directly. We, we try to make that contact to talk to them. Have you talked to so-and-so, these organizations? Here's a list. We, we'll talk to the council members directly, asking them if they've been contacted yet, are they aware? Um, more so just, to, just to, at times to notify for us, we know we know that just emailing an RNO doesn't mean that it's going to get to the community, right? It depends if the RNO is active, who the, the board member is, are they sharing with their members? At times, it doesn't work. So for us, we try to go a, a, a level lower. We try to go to, the, to a community serving organization to notify, and that's where we bridge the connection with the developer. Again, we can't require them require them to do it, but we definitely strongly encourage and highly recommend as much as we can before we become too um, pestering, if you will, of, of, of how much we ask them and really try to be inclusive. But we also, as NEST, will notify those organizations if we know something's coming. Great. Thank you very much, Elvis. There was also a question about who the engagement um, person is from CPD, and it is Mike Ramsey, who was speaking with us. So. Thanks, Mike, for doing that role as well as for speaking. And Londell, you have a question. Would you like to um, articulate your question? Certainly, and I'm sorry that um, my memory is, is still, is, is well, it's aging, but um, regard, related to the, the maps, um, and it was one of the, it was the yellow map that related to the, um, I guess, calculation of um, uh, the map determination that Sarah of, showed. Yes, the, the ter mm -hmm. determination of how, of at-risk neighborhoods and, or maybe it was the purple map or it was one of those colored maps. Um, and it related to, yes, um, and it related to renter occupied units. And I'm not, I was just curious why only renter um, occupied because particularly pairing that to uh, <clears throat> um, with individuals with bachelor's degrees, and I and I'm and I'm using that looking at the area in which I live, which you know I know a lot of older families that live in that neighborhood who actually own their homes, and I don't necessarily know if they have a bachelor's degree. And they're being excluded from this type of calculation, um, and so it's skewing the the determinant, which then skews how this graphic looks. And so I'm just curious why why just renter occupied units? I'd be happy to take that one again, uh, Liz Weigel, um, and. So when Blueprint Denver, and there's a number of people on the call who were part of that Blueprint Denver process, there was a lot of research done into and talking to departments about um, kind of data points we're already using, what research has been done nationally, um, and our uh, what's now our housing uh, department that host or housing opportunity and stability, if I'm saying that right, um, had done a study previously about uh, displacement and um, involuntary displacement that looked nationally at best practices. And you're absolutely right that these are these are just indicators. They're not um, meant to be that these are the only people that are at risk of displacement. Um, but there was some research done about that these tend to be that good uh, indicator piece, right? When you have a lot, large number of renters, um, they are at risk for rents going up, um, for you know, a landlord making a, a change, uh, um, you know, evicting them or something to that sort. So that that is a good indicator that they're 
um, is a risk happening there when you see these three indicators come together. So it was really looking at a research that we had done um, and used previously um, in the city that helped us get to some of those points that you see. But it's, it's a story and I think something, what you're bringing up is something that we wanna talk about, right? What are the other areas that we need to be aware of and thinking of as we have rezoning um, or types of residents that we should be thinking about? Yeah, and, the, and what also comes up for me, and thank you for that. Um, and what also comes up for me is, I think the point in time in which that data, those data were collected, because I also assume that, you know, the, there was probably some movement already happening within these areas, to which, again, may have given a um, a false indicator that, you know, that this neighborhood isn't um, in any sort of, uh, it's not vulnerable because it's already happened in this neighborhood. And so, and if you see that like on the, the, the east side of some, well, of particularly I live in district one, so that's where I was looking on, on the east side and there is a very defined line um, where it was a bit darker and it gets darker further east. And as I live there, I see that, you know, the, the, on the west side, it's definitely was, it's changed, it's changed and I've lived there for 15 years and now it's kind of moving east as, as, as time goes on. And so I guess, again, you know, looking at the points in time in which those, those data are collected, um, and then applying that lens to it um, to figure out, well, is are these neighborhoods vulnerable? Um, but I, I do hear what you're saying, but thank you. But, but maybe I think, Linda, what you might be asking is both for the NEST and CPD definitions, what is the period of time for the data collection? Is that part of what you're trying to get at? Definitely, um, because, you know, what, what could be um, like right now, my, I'm going to, again, self-servingly, I'm going to use my, my neighborhood as, as an example. Um, right now, my, my street, my block is fairly untouched by development. Um, however, two streets over, it's happening like gangbusters. Um, and that's on the west side of me, behind me. And, um, and on my street, there are there are more individuals who have lived there and raised their families, and their families have raised their families. And my husband and I are are you know not to be morbid, are fearful that when they die, that they're going to leave their houses and they're going to be sold because they can be sold, and then bulldozed and so on and so forth. And so. While right now, it may not look like it's our neighborhood is vulnerable for dis, um, displacement. However, um, it very well could be because the people that now live there, they own their homes, um, but once <clears throat> they're in a position, they may no longer be able to continue to live there because of how the rest of the neighborhood is changing and raising the standard of living or the cost of living rather, um, and the inability to maintain um, what they've always had there, if that makes any sense at all. So really encouraging us to think over time and what period of time we're thinking about as we think about equity and gentrification. Any thoughts from NEST or CPD in response to Wandell's concern? Sure, uh, I, can, I can answer from the NEST perspective on how we build our index. Um, Lundell, just so you're, you're aware, we follow the ACS data drop. So it's every two to three years. That's when we update a lot of our information. We're currently now going through our, a nest update, if you will, for the neighborhoods, thinking about how we designate our index, our, our indicators in the index that we use are growing. So we hear, I hear you, what you're saying, right? For us, we, we don't, we don't do the rent or occupy. We do the cost burden because it includes homeowners and that'll allow us to show like people who can't pay their property tax, taxes, et cetera. We are thinking more at a more holistic approach to displacement from a nest perspective. We're also including business data 
um, to, to be, to take a more, again, holistic approach to it, but think about it more how we can address neighborhood dynamics and cultural as a whole, not just solely focused on housing, if that makes sense, from a Nest perspective. We're really trying to, to think of equity at the big picture rather than so granular, but we are, our index is changing. Um, Nest neighborhoods will be changing. I don't have a date for you. It takes time to, to, to research and analyze all the data um, and really listen to community. We don't want to arbitrarily just change things without kind of just hearing if it's along the right track, right? We have to kind of listen to everyone and then go from there. But we are we are working on it. We just so a two to three, two to three year cadence, long story short, is what we're following, which follows the ACS data drop, which is the American Community Survey. I apologize that we speak in acronym. Uh, it's the American Community Survey uh, data from the census. Great. Anything from CPD and then we'll go to other questions or yeah, comments. I think, from the group. I think Elvis uh, covered it really well. I think we, there is always the opportunity to kind of look at what indicators are we using, which other ones should we be using, but we do also update as we have new census data. So those um, would change over time. Great, thank you. Other thoughts or questions from the group about how the city's thinking about equity and how it impacts the work that we are working on together. Oh, we have a quiet task force today. Yes, Brendan? Would somebody be able to just post the, the city definition of equity in the chat? Sure. And Jason, do you want to? You... I'll, I'll, I'll post the link to our webpage. Great. Thank you. Um, is it OK if I ask a quick question? Uh, Jason, Please do you me. know if the city's definition of equity is different than the definition of equity that was put, set forth in Blueprint? Because I know that we, I, I mean, I learned a lot in that process, and I'm just curious if they differ. It is a little bit different. Um, I, I think ours is just a little bit more nuanced to where the city, it's a little bit more vague so that it can capture all of the nuances of the work that's happening across the city. Um, Councilwoman Sandoval. Yeah, I was just gonna ask the same thing as Catlin. Um, I think that our term of equity, I think that equity is a term that gets hijacked a lot in these processes. And so we need to make sure that we're using this term related to community planning and development because I use that term when I'm talking about um, other processes, but I think that we need to make sure that we have a, a, a definition to Caitlin's, Caitlin's point that we're talking about that we can reference back in Blueprint Denver, that we can rep reference back in this process instead of just throwing the term around equity all the time because I know that like the Office of Children's Affairs might have a different term of equity and lens of equity than the police department, than the fire department, than city council. So can we define equity specifically for this process and for CPD? Sarah or Liz, do you ever want to answer any of that? I, I think that's a great comment and suggestion. That's something we can consider. And I'd be curious if we, if maybe it's a definition in itself or if that kind of plays out with sort of the recommendations or some of the solutions we come up with. Um, or sorry, let me backtrack. If that kind of ties into our goals, if we're able to say like our goal is to do this and it kind of defines what equity should play out as with the review criteria or the notification process and stuff. So I think we can definitely wrap it into the goals, but I'd be curious to hear from others if they'd be interested in um, us coming up with a formal definition for equity for this project. Robin? I think uh, Councilwoman Sandoval makes a great point that because the, the stakeholders are different and the impact of the communities in the communities is different than you might have with early childhood or another subject area, having a, having a consensus definition for what equity is in this context really does make sense. Alfonso? <clears throat> um, I think generally speaking, it's a very good idea to have a, a definition that's appropriate uh, to land use planning and zoning specifically. Uh, but I say that with the caveat and the nuance uh, take that. Um, I don't want to see a definition that omits um, where a lot of the concerns around equity and rezoning come from, which is displacement. Um, 
neighborhoods, communities that have been uh, overexploited, um, where zoning has been used historically as a tool to marginalize and exploit those communities. Um, so of course we need a definition, but I would hate to see it go um, away from that, you know, or I guess when defining that together, it should be alluding and in reference to that situation at hand. Thanks, Alfonso. And um, Andrew just posted um, in the chat for us the blueprint definition of, of equity. And so you can see there, there's a lot of language about treating people the same. Um, and I think that's what part of what you're getting at. It's, it's got to be deeper than that, I think is what you're suggesting. Am I correct? Um, not just deeper, but very much specifically um, a definition that is addressing the concerns around displacement um, is addressing the history uh, of zoning uh, and land use planning um, in order to uh, enact exploitation of these communities. So it's not just being deeper um, because I also don't think that it should be easier for a multi-million dollar uh, developer to have the exact same process as a small person um, who's only rezoning for an ADU, for example. Um, because if that's what the definition of an equity is gonna come down to um, where it's like, it's equal for all doesn't mean that it's equitable for all. Um, so, but in, in that regard, the definition has to be very, in my opinion, at least, hitting at, at the point of, you know, the context of the history of zoning, especially in Denver, mm -hmm. right? There's that famous inverted L um, that comes up so many times in various different forms of data and maps across the city. Um, so I don't wanna, you know, I want that the focus of the definition to be towards that and centered around um, first and foremost, addressing uh, zoning as a, as a tool that's been historically used to exploit our communities. Thank you. And Myra's uh, reminding us that we shouldn't treat equity and equality as the same. Other thoughts? I'm seeing lots of head nods. Anything else on this? Okay, we will come back to you all um, to work on that piece. And so Going with what um, Jason talked about, which is in equity, we have to think both about the product and the process. We're gonna talk for a few minutes about the process of how we came together to be selected to be on this team of working together and also the, some of the process of how we might work together. So Sarah, help us understand a little bit more about how we all got to be in this room together. All right, I am going to share my screen yet again. <laughs> so hopefully you can see that now. Uh, so there are some questions at the first task force meeting about how we even select a task force. And so I just wanted to go over this process and um, answer any questions you might have outside of this. So the first thing to start with is that we developed guidance for the selection of the task force. So this is essentially the selection criteria that's located on our webpage. If you go to the community task force section, we actually posted the, the criteria there. Uh, so the guidance for this project was for the task force to be made up of a diverse representation of individuals. So this includes racial and ethnic diversity, broad range of ages, geographic diversity, gender diversity, income diversity, and diversity of housing. For example, residents who rent their home versus um, owning their home. So in addition to that, we looked to have guidance that also stated that uh, task force members should have a variety of viewpoints, expertise, and experience. So kind of a combination of all of these different things. So we looked at what the viewpoints, expertise, and experience might be. Um, we looked to include people who may be considered land use and um, development experts, neighborhood advocates, uh, or people potentially affected by the project. Um, there's additional information, again, on that selection criteria a PDF that's located on the webpage as well. Um, so that was a quick summary of kind of developing this guidance for the selection. So after we developed the guidance, then we created the interest form that you guys all filled out to be on this task force. So the form included information to better understand potential applicants. So to understand if we can meet our goals um, for that guidance that we developed. So then after that, we advertised for task force members through our website, email blasts, social media, so kind of that open advertisement. In addition to that, we also did focused outreach. So we met with council members, we connected with community organizations um, and things like that to 
kind of start our focus outreach. So we had this call for task force members open for a while, this kind of open application period. And then at some point we closed it. And kind of the last thing that happened is that the planning team evaluated and selected the members. And I just wanna reiterate that I know, you know, initially we were looking for 15 to 25 members. We ended up with around 25 members. And it's unfortunate we can't include everyone on the task force, uh, but at some point, um, you know, the selection was made and we have the members that we have here today. But as a reminder as well, like the task force is just one component of the outreach and kind of the community engagement of this project. So we have you guys, which will have reoccurring monthly meetings with you. You'll be a main point of contact to give us feedback and help us connect to the community as well. But in addition to that, we also have the plan focused outreach, our broader outreach, such as the community meeting that I mentioned, we'll continue with our briefings with city council, as well as uh, communicating the project with our various kind of digital ways. Um, so posting things on our webpage and sending out emails and things like that. But I just uh, wanted to give a quick summary of the selection process and then a reminder that it's kind of one piece of the puzzle and that again, we're trying to continually advance our community engagement and outreach and it's constantly evolving. So this is a general summary of what we have today, but it can't mean that it you know, won't change as we go along in this project, depending on the needs for it as well. Um, so I'll pass it back to Rox, or um, if anyone has any questions, let me know as well. Any questions before I proceed? Okay, thank you very much, Sarah. And Sabrina, if you wouldn't mind screen sharing. Um, for the last two meetings, we have sent you out in advance um, a draft of how we, we might work together. And going back again to what Jason said, a process and product matter, right? And so this is thinking about what's our process for working together. And because you've had this document a couple of times, I'm not going to read it um, to you, but I'm going to just highlight areas and then ask you at the end if you have any questions or concerns that would keep you from being able to agree to it. You know, in every document, we could wordsmith like crazy. And I'd ask you all to avoid that. We're really looking for, is there anything in this that um, either you would say right on to, or well, hold up a minute, we need to, to talk this through. So let's talk first about the role of the task force members. First, we're so glad you're, you're here. Um, we're already seeing people entertain alternative um, viewpoints. And, and that's part of our job, right? Is to listen to each other and hear each other. And a number of you in your introductions today already talked about representing this work with larger constituent groups. And we know and understand that it's a commitment of time, energy, and resources to engage in this um, so we ask that people come with the ability to be actively um, in, in attendance at the meetings. And we know sometimes, particularly in these days, we have kiddos, we have home emergencies, that sort of thing, but we really appreciate your active participation. And during the meetings, um, how we would work together. So Sabrina, let's move on down a little bit. For those of us who are extroverts, we'd ask that you allow time for the introverts to be able to speak up. For those of you who are introverts, we want to um, make space and encourage you to speak up. And it's okay to use chat if in the moment you are, are, are trying to form an opinion or a question, that sort of thing, but we, we encourage making space for each other. You know, we are going to disagree as we go through this process. We ask that that occur um, based on the conversation in the moment and also that you know, we try to do that in a respectful tone with each other. We love it when you have your cameras on. It's so helpful to your speakers, your facilitators. It's great to see head nods, but it also helps convey to anyone who is speaking that other folks are present and, and hearing them. You know, as we go through this and eventually get to recommendations, we'll think about recommendations and, and be making some recommendations. And we know that you may leave the room and something come to mind that makes you say afterwards, whoops, I agree to something that I actually don't think is right. And if that happens for you, um, that you loop back around and let CPD staff know or ourselves know, um, so that we know that coming into the next meeting so we don't go forward and think we have everybody in agreement and then find out that, you know, there was a major thing that was thought about that we didn't consider. So, so bringing that back to the group is super helpful. 
In terms of our roles and the role of the project team, the role of the three of us with Strategy with Rocks is to, to really help you in these meetings and process that sort of thing. The role of the CPD staff is to keep bringing you not just process information, but technical information to be really good references for the Comprehensive Plan 2040 Blueprint Denver. We know that um, they are experts in those areas and we don't expect others to have to be experts in, in that. Um, and we'll be looking for when we have points of agreement and disagreement. The task force meetings, thank you for bearing with us as we've got the format in place. We've been resending meeting invites, trying to have people get the right links and all of that. We will always record the meetings so that you can go back and look at them. And we will try to keep these meetings to monthly, two hours. But as you know from the orientation, um, that was an added meeting. So from time to time, we will be doing additional meetings, community outreach meetings, those sorts of things, and, and encouraging you to attend if you are able. But these are our monthly meetings on Wednesdays that are really the essential meetings. In terms of communication, you know, it is one of those things that we can't do anything about. We are subject to the Colorado Opens Records Act. And so if you send an email on um, the notes that we post, all of that, um, it, it could be what we call CORID, um, so that we would have to share it with media. <clears throat> and along those lines, we love it if you are promoting these meetings, promoting people to come listen in, talking to your neighborhood associations about what's going on, that sort of thing. Um, we also know that from time to time in these kinds of public um, sessions, you may see information that is incorrect. And we'd ask if you see that, if you could direct it to CPD so we can get the right information out. And that we would always work on that our process is to increase equity. Um, knowing we have some work, Alfonso and others to do on the definition of that um, term so that we they were able to talk about it in a way we all understand. Um, in our first meeting, we already had media who had joined us. Um, I'm not certain if any of our participants today are also media. Um, but that will happen. You always have the right to decline to comment. We do ask that um, if you do um, comment that sort of thing to the media or you are asked to comment, even if you decline, that you just let the CPD staff know so they know what else is happening out there in that. So let me stop there. And you had this is an attachment with your agenda today. Um, and, and see if there are first questions, and then we'll go to if there's any um, questions that lead to concerns that would keep anybody from being able to, to agree to this and return it to CPD. All right, let me ask us a different way. Um, is, is there any, is everyone at this point a, feeling comfortable with being able to sign this agreement? I'm seeing some thumbs up, um, some head nods, those are making me happy. We can also do thumbs down or head nods the other way. Are we, we sounds like we are, um, Anna, you have your hand raised. No, Brittany does, I'm sorry. Does somebody have your hand raised? That was a mistake, my bad. I was just saying I was agreeing with you, my bad. Oh. Just That's not a bad at all. Thank you. And thank you for the clarity on that. Great. So super, super helpful. And I think, um, Sabrina, we can come off of screen share now. And, um, you know, we've also referenced something we've called gradients of agreement. And basically on Zoom, it works like fist to five, that if we're getting to a place where we're finally making recommendations, we're going to be asking you, do you agree? you know, um, all in, or would you like to stay neutral or you disagree? And we'll be doing some straw polling along the way because oftentimes we refer to it as consensus and we're actually gonna stop in the moment and have you actually raise your hands or, um, or let us know um, if we can't see you that you're in alignment with, an, with a decision 
you may choose it because you either feel like you're like a council member may choose that they don't want to vote on something specific because they, they feel like, you know, they have a different place to vote on it or you don't know enough. You'll also have the ability to say, I don't have an opinion on this topic um, or to say, you know, I really feel strongly that that's not the right way to proceed. So we'll be trying to get, um, you know, kind of a fist of five. I really like it too. I've got concerns um, rather than have a full thumbs up, thumbs down on things. So we know where we're at um, as we move forward. So knowing that what would be great for folks is if you wouldn't mind affixing an electronic signature um, and Sabrina can, or Yvonne, can you just send it out to everyone again on the task force so they have it at the top of their inbox? and ask you to um, electronically sign it and send it back to, to Sarah. So if you download it, just type in your name, that's fine. If you, if you prefer to affix a, a written signature, that's fine. Take a picture and send it back, however it, uh, you do not need Adobe to sign it. Um, Mara, we're just taking, if you electronically sign it and send it back, so you can type in your name and send it back that way. We wanted to make this as easy as possible for folks and we trust you that if you send it back with an email saying i'm good to go that you're good to go okay great um so moving on from there sarah i'm gonna turn it back to you since we don't have a lot of conversation or questions about that and talk about where we're going next yeah, so I mentioned a little bit about the upcoming kind of community engagement at the beginning of the meeting, but I'll just do a reminder that our next, next task, task force meeting is March 23rd. And at that meeting, we really are going to be going full steam ahead and kind of moving forward with looking at um, what are the goals that we want, what's the problem statement, and start looking at kind of those quick wins and then moving the best practices as well. And from this point onward, we'll try to give you guys a heads up of what each task force meeting will be about. And we may be updating them as we go, but we'll try to give you at least like one task force meeting in advance, if not a few, so you know kind of what the conversation will be about and how we're actually moving forward in the project as well. Um, and then again, yes, we'll reach out once we've scheduled the first community meeting, but that won't be until the next couple of months, just making sure we can get a date that works for people. So that's just the quick reminder that I had for upcoming community engagement. And we promise you all that this was the most talking heads you will have in any meetings going forward. Um, we had a lot to get through today, but it is not our goal going forward to have this kind of presentation, but we will be moving into, like we did in the first meeting, a lot more discussion and conversation. So Thank you all so much for bearing with us through that process. And at this point, we are going to go to public comment. We have three additional community members who have joined us and um, open it up for if um, David or Bethany or Hannah, um, if any of you have any questions or comments that you would like to share with the group. Hi, this is David Sabatos. Uh, I'm the editor of the Denver North Star and GES Gazette. You mentioned before there might be media present and hi, just listening, thanks. Thanks so much for identifying yourself, David, and we are delighted to have media interested in these and on this conversations and this important topic. So thank you for being here. Hi, and this is Bethany Gravel, not with the media. Um, I'm just here monitoring for um, several clients and my own personal interest. Great, Bethany. We, we welcome that from, from folks who have an interest, um, both a direct and indirect interest, and um, always appreciate any feedback that you have for yourself or from your clients as we move forward. Yep. Great. Anybody else? Uh, I'm Hannah. I'm an MSW student at the University of Denver. Um, I'm here, honestly, for an assignment. It's related to a bill that I've been researching. Um, it's been really interesting. <laughs> Great. We welcome curious uh, minds and um, people who will have um, long-term impact in how do we do this work. So thank you for all for being here. And I'm not hearing any additional questions from you all. So I'm going to go turn it back to our task force members. 
and see if there are comments or questions or thoughts from you all before we close out today. Anna? Excuse me, sorry. Yeah, I did have a quick comment and um, I know we're nearing, we still have some time, but I'd love to hear from other task force members. Um, like in the chat, we were talking about the difference between equity and equality. And as I mentioned in the beginning, um, I'm here because as a small time rezoning applicant, I learned how truly entrenched um, in racism our zoning codes are. We've seen how Denver, um, how the Denver communities of color have completely been rede redeveloped where our more affluent communities haven't. And in fact, they've benefited greatly from the absence of new development. And so that's funny, like when I saw this committee, I wish it was called equity and zoning, <laughs> but um, because I truly believe zoning is one of the big biggest barriers to equality we have in this country. And so sometimes I fear that if we make the rezoning process more difficult, we are in effect helping people in affluent communities avoid new construction. Um, you know, I, I think we need more housing and it's time our affluent neighbors, our neighborhood supported that. And yeah, I just, I guess wanted to hear your thoughts on this. Like if you agree, if you have the same concerns I do. Great, I think that's a, a perfect question. Um, and, and I think it was Myra who started us off with thinking about equity versus equality. So I don't know if you'd like to go there and then Councilwoman Sandoval. I'll defer to Myra first. Can you all hear me? Sometimes I have an issue with my phone, but I'm in transit now. All good. Okay, perfect. Um, no, Anna, definitely agree with that. I think that we definitely need to create some kind of protections in our communities because we've seen strongfold in our neighborhoods how um, units have been converted into multi-million dollar um, units. I used to be over on the oh, yeah. north side and the unit next to us was a home that's next to DHA and it was scraped and then $2 million dollar um, units, they built a duplex next to us, um, $2 million, each unit was a million dollars and they were built and they were allowed to build and they used zoning and they used this push for the need for more housing as a way to accomplish that. And there was zero regard for the people in that community. We, we know and we've seen a lot of older adults in that area. Um, there's a food pantry right behind those now two multi, <laughs> that, that, those now million dollar units. Um, and we're seeing these people coming in, scraping our homes, building in units that we cannot afford. And then because of our increase in taxes, we're being displaced, we're being pushed out and zoning has been a tool to do that. Um, and we're not benefiting from it. And so I completely agree. And I would like for us to think creatively um, and also radically, if we allow for um, whether it's policy, whether it's laws, whether it's an administrative thing, um, we allow for unjust things to happen. And we rarely think radically about how we're going to solve these historic um, injustices. And so I'm really hoping, and I feel encouraged, Anna, by what, by what you said, um, and, and hoping that we can do this and be a model for the country. Thank you. Councilwoman Sandoval and then Caitlin. Thank you. So I've had the opportunity in the last, um, seems like a long time during because of COVID, to serve on the um, Expanding Housing Affordability Task Force. It's a policy that's moving through the city right now to look at affordable housing and add density in certain areas if you add more affordable housing. And so I would just, I'll put the link in the chat and I would just encourage all of you to take a moment to look at that. And if you work on with somebody provide public comment. The public comment is open until March 14th. And so this, I think that there's, I think a lot of times the city is working on projects in silos and we don't always do a really good job at getting community feedback and getting this information in front of people. And so this is a new group of people who I'm able to share this information. Some of you are know about this project. I know Joel and Aaron, all of you others that are um, on the planning board have been briefed on this. But please look at this proposal because it will mandate affordable housing because right now the only way that you can get affordable housing required in a project during a rezoning is through a development agreement with the city. And this will be 
any part of the city that redevelops into 10 units or more will have to produce some type of affordable housing. So just wanted to plug that in into the conversation. Right, thank you. And we're gonna to go to Caitlin, Alfonso, Brittany, and then Lindsay, I'm gonna ask you to, to raise your concern from chat to the group. So Caitlin, Alfonso, and Lindsay. Hi, um, thank you, Anna, for raising it and, and Myra too. And, and I, I think I just wanted to parse a bit of a difference in some of the comments that I heard um, related to redevelopment and just kind of the driver of like the market redeveloping. Um, and, and the desire to, uh, you know, certain neighborhoods become popular and people want to scrape and, and replace, and that is really disruptive to those neighborhoods versus the zone, the role that the, the a rezoning plays in it. Does that make sense? So I think that there's a lot of places that are just developing under their existing zoning and there can still be a lot of development happening versus the role that the rezoning process plays in rezoning a property to allow for a redevelopment. So slightly different. And I think both have different issues that are being raised and tackled. But um, I, I think, and, and I guess I'd be curious on staff's opinion, but you know, if we're focused on the role of equity in rezoning, I don't know that we're going to, uh, not that they aren't issues and, and very valid to be discussed, but that we can address displacement generally or something like that. Yep. Thanks, Caitlin, for reminding us our focus is on the rezoning process, but hopefully it can be applied to other areas. Okay, we're gonna go to Brittany, Alfonso, Lindsay, and then Joel and Londell. Thank you, I'll make this quick and I'm not quite sure if this is the proper place for this, but I work with a lot of smaller mom and pop owners. Some of these owners may own just like one, one unit or you know up to about 200 units and some of the uh ongoing concerns that i'm hearing with them is around some of the new uh building codes that are coming online that they feel like is pushing them out of like ownership and their ability to continue property management and ownership like especially around some of the codes around making all of the uh, some of the buildings more energy efficient. So some of the older buildings that owners have, um, they're worried about having to switch things over to electric just because of the, uh, the cost of doing that and not being able to afford to do that. And these are owners who are keeping like one bedrooms around like $900. Um, and these buildings are paid for, which is awesome. But these, these are owners trying to provide that affordable um, rent and worried about some of the future changes. And I think that maybe some of the parts around rezoning and looking at some of the, like the new upgrades and new changes to some of our building codes that we have here that, you know, will affect um, home ownership and owners in general. I just wanted to throw that out there. CPD staff, do you want to respond any to that at this point? Would those constitute a rezoning? Potentially. Oh, I was going to just chime in for a different comment because I think uh, looking at sustainability and aspects like that are very interesting. And some other people had brought that up in the focus group meetings as well. And so I'd be curious to see what we could consider as, as part of the rezoning process. Um, I didn't know if anyone else wanted to chime in on um, the other question. Okay, let's go to Alfonso, Lindsay, Joel, Londell. Um, I think just in response to the question that was posed earlier, um, I think generally speaking, of course, um, there needs to be a component of, uh, of an analysis of the, the role that race plays in redevelopment in, in communities that are vulnerable to displacement and, and how zoning does impact in terms of property values, um, increased density, increased uh, public infrastructure um, that really incentivizes growth um, leaving a lot of people behind. Um, but I am concerned um, about the idea of uh, sacrificing, or I guess just to put it bluntly, uh, I'm not here to shed tears um, for developers who have been making a killing. Um, all this building has resulted in more disparities 
Um, I'm not here to buy into uh, simple um, arguments like supply and demand is an issue. Um, I'm here to advocate for equity in our communities. Um, I've seen some groups uh, which, um, you know, I won't get too much into it, that advocate for equity, but at the end of the day, we'll stand side by side with developers um, in, an equitable, in an inequitable process against communities like ours. Um, so I will just remain steadfast in my representation of our communities, um, our lived experience, our, our collective research experience, um, factual data that, that points to the things that I am talking about. Um, and of course, race will always play a part in that in this country. Um, but I will not uh, sit idly by as race is used as a, as a way to implement uh, further inequitable zoning in our city um, that will ultimately disparately impact um, communities like ours. Great, thank you, Alfonso. Um, Lindsay, you put something in the chat. Did you wanna bring it, share it with the whole group? Sure, can you hear me, Rock? Yep. Thanks. Um, it was in response to what Anna or Anna had put in the chat, and I think it's also what Alfonso was just responding to. Just a comment that um, thinking about equity and rezoning, and then a lot of us are just talking about development, is um, it's uh, thinking about the impact on vulnerable communities and, and the nest neighborhoods, but then also thinking about the other side of the equity coin is how affluent neighborhoods can um, bear more of the burden of development. And I think Alfonso's point is really important that um, if groups are advocating for more housing, thinking about where, and more development, more housing, where that goes is important. I'm kind of talking about general, more, I'm kind of talking in generalities now, but I just wanted to say that equity isn't just about how vulnerable, vulnerable groups are negatively affected, it's about how privileged groups are positively affected or not affected at all. So kind of a generality statement, but I just wanted to throw it out there. Um, wait, there was one more thing I wanted to say. Um, oh, and I, I hear the point about, um, about uh, that this is about rezoning and not about zoning. However, I think that typically because we know that most development happens by right and the city is not involved at all. Rezoning is the one time where there is some power to demand um, more, more things or demand anything really, or to expect anything than just what that property owner or developer wants to do with their land. So while it's true, this is only about redevelopment, or I'm sorry, while it's true, this is only about rezoning and not about zoning in general, um, we're not going to rezone the whole city with this. That's not the point. Um, but I think, I think um, that when when something is up for rezoning, that is the time where there's an opportunity to demand more. So I hope that all makes sense. So Lindsay, you did. I don't know if you can see people nodding their heads about the equity piece and who gets impacted. Um, and also nodding heads about yes, let's seize every opportunity we get to make a difference in this. Um, Joel and then Londell, and then I'll ask if there's anybody who hasn't had a chance to speak yet who would like to speak before we, we move to close. Joel and then Londell. Uh, yeah, Dr. Shara, can you put me on to speak, please? Um, yes, yeah, sure can, Shara. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, I just, uh, this actually works really well coming after Lindsay because she's exactly right. Um, not all development is. Um, preceded by rezoning, our, our pre-reading um, kind of covered that pretty well. So how can we demand more? And if we only demand more at rezoning time, we're only demanding more of very little of the development that happens. So I, I wanna thank Councilwoman Sandoval for bringing up the uh, uh, expanding housing affordability program. Maybe, maybe it would make sense. I know Rox, you talked about not having a lot of presentations at future meetings, but maybe a short presentation to this group on that effort as it as it nears the home stretch would be important because it's it's going to require you know real contributions of affordable units from from all large developments whether or not there's rezoning involved and that'll help us focus on you know what what's left and i just want to say my favorite part of land use planning in, in denver is neighborhood plans and i really want to find a way that 
um, when everybody's been together for a couple of years working on a neighborhood plan, comparing their different ideas, influencing each other and finding that consensus, if there's some way to then, as the next step, build off of that and, and go into rezonings, including doing what Blueprint never uh, called for, which is attaching additional tools, especially anti-displacement tools, to that uh, rezoning that would be led by the city um, while people are still engaged and at the table, that could really change the dynamic. And um, I, I'm hoping we can get to something like that through this effort. Thank you, Joel Londell. Yeah, um, and I think I'm at this point, I'm probably, um, you know, beating a dead horse, but I'll just, uh, just make the statement that um, when it comes to redevelopment and rezoning, um, they kind of do go hand in hand. Um, you know, as I was waiting for my turn to, to talk, I, I, I was looking up information to support my, my poor memory of um, some time ago when there was redevelopment happening in Washington Park, the Wash Park neighborhood, um, people were very, very, became very angry that they were building very large houses on uh, very small plots of land because Wash Park was known to have small bungalows. And um, the neighborhood began, West, Park, West, West Wash Park um, began to raise a fuss about uh, that they don't want, they didn't want large boxy things in their neighborhoods because they were uh, obtrusive, they were blocking, you know, all the things that some, several of us, or let me say this differently, that I complain about now when I see these large boxy homes. And this was back in 2008. And they lobbied successfully to have those types of homes to, um, to not be built at that point. And as I was researching that, I found that not only were they, were they successful in Washington Park, but they were also successful in the Sloan's Lake neighborhood as well as in South Park Hill. The, three th or the one thing that these three communities have in common is that they are primarily, um, primarily predominantly white neighborhoods who are fairly affluent. Now, moving forward, we now find that most of these types of housing are moving into neighborhoods that are not that demographic, that have somehow found a way to, under the guise of meeting a housing shortage, um, are building these big boxy million dollar homes and duplexes to fulfill some need. And so this is a case where rezoning can affect redevelopment and where it also affects displacement. Again, going back to the, the couple of examples that have already been mentioned, where you have a home that for whatever reason is worth a couple hundred thousand dollars and it's scraped down and to be built two or one building that's divided in two to create a duplex where each duplex is sold for one million dollars. Then nobody in that neighborhood can live there anymore. And so it's, it's, it feels like and it seems like a deliberate effort to not include the people that are in that neighborhood any longer. Mm -hmm. And so to create um, that opportunity to, um, you know, to, to affect the zoning opportunities, the zoning process, to include redevelopment efforts that include surrounding communities, um, I think that also addresses the equity, not equality, but the equity piece in which we are broaching um, at the early part of our discussion. 
Thanks, Lindell, and thanks for giving us real world examples as well. Um, and as we go to Shara for a final comment from her, um, if you have things that you liked about this meeting or things you'd like to have changed, please put it in the chat. We felt like this conversation was too important and, and, and we can handle that off on the side on chat and wanted to give the time for this dialogue to happen. So Shara, go ahead. Wonderful, thank you so much. And thank you so much to everyone on this call. I've been listening to all of the feedback. I do apologize, I'm joining via phone today um, and that was the best that I could do. Um, so I do apologize for not being able to be visible, but I've been listening to everyone and really appreciating the diversity of feedback. Um, there was something that I, I thought I heard earlier that I wanted to flag uh, for all of us just as a group. Um, and I, I thought I heard the comparison of um, diverse communities or communities of color being referenced juxtaposed to affluent communities. And so um, if I heard that correctly, um, what I'm also hearing is the conflation of affluence with whiteness. And I think that it is really important to um, to be mindful of language and the way that we are defining things and to define affluence um, as synonymous with whiteness, I think is certainly or would be a mistake on the part of this group, particularly given our task. Um, so if I heard that correctly, I just want to flag that for all of us so that we can be um, just mindful of, of language as we approach this work. And then the second thing I wanted to just mention really quickly as I've been hearing from everyone is that whole concept of equity versus equality. Um, so the way that I have processed equality has been, I think what someone mentioned, treating everyone the same. And on, you know, on the surface, that sounds like a really nice thing, but often the challenge with that is that it doesn't account for historical disparities and the ways that people have been marginalized. Um, and so when I look at the definition of equity, I think more about creating the same opportunity for people as opposed to treating everyone the same. And creating the same opportunity can sometimes involve doing a lot more work for marginalized communities so that they can be engaged in a particular process and can show up to a table where others have um, had the opportunity to frequent more often than them. So I wanted to just add that to, uh, to the conversation for some consideration. I'm sure we'll be discussing these points um, in more detail as we continue with our meetings, but I just really appreciated everyone's feedback and, and uh, comments today. It helped me to kind of think more uh, deeply about the way that I look at this work and approach this work. So thank you, everyone. Thanks for reminding us we have to keep going deeper and being clear about our terminology and what we mean and in that also speaking the truth for our truth as we do that. Mara, I'm gonna give you the last comment. I know some of you are already having to leave at five, but go ahead. Um, well, I just wanted to comment on the um, webinar registration form that we fill out every week. Um, I wanted to point out that there's a question that says of which racial, ethnic or cultural group you consider yourself a member of. And there's no option for um, Latino Hispanic. Um, and so I just, I wanted to flag that. I think I flagged that at the, uh, uh, during the last survey, but I wanted to flag that because it is a racing. Um, for example, I, I can't check any of these, but I have to because it's required. And so I, I wanted to flag that. Thanks for our, uh, and host, our host um, CPD staff heard that for sure. So thank you all so very, very much. Um, Sarah, any final comments from you? What a great conversation today. Yeah, I, I think that's it. I think that this was a great conversation to end with today. I know we talked about a lot of different things. Some of them can be a difficult topic to cover, but I appreciate you guys being here and kind of going over what equity means, what the city's doing related to equity. And I, I hope that will help us with our conversation moving forward as we start to apply these concepts to the project itself. And as we're starting to talk about kind of solutions or other issues that are coming up. So yeah, I hope this was helpful for you guys and thank you guys so much um, for attending. Thank you all, bye-bye. <laughs>